What is going on, Notre Dame fans? Mike Singer and Mike Goolsby here for... It's been too long. It's been too long since we've done our last Mike Goolsby show. Mr. Goolsby, how are you doing, my friend? I'm great, buddy. Yeah, time flies. Good to be back. Yeah, I think we had you on a, a couple shows with Tim Hyde recently, but we're back with an off-season edition of the Mike Goolsby show. Please do hit the thumbs up on the video um, and uh, subscribe to our channel, of course, if you have not done so yet. If you're listening via podcast, uh, please leave a friendly <clears throat> review. Um, Mike, you're looking great, man. I, I just have to say that before we dive into today's topics. Been hitting the gym. I mean, you, you look like a million bucks, man. So you weren't rocking the schmedium there? Oh, this is a double X, just to be clear <laughs> uh, for anybody in the comments. But yeah, thanks, man. Pool season's around the corner. So yeah, I've been trying to ramp it up a little bit, you know. Fighting father time over here, brother gets harder and harder you know you're at 40, 40 years old now so you gotta like be extra diligent you know pick your spots with the taco bell you know what i mean do you just do you just have your 40th recently oh last september so i mean shoot i'm you know climbing up on 41 i guess damn like i'm about to hit 30 so time well, is 30 is a weird age man 30 is a weird age i'm not sure know? what to think about it we'll talk about it but yeah it's an interesting age Cause you're like, you know, did I, did I, have I accomplished enough? Am I where I should be? You kind of have that pre sort of existential crisis going on, you know? I feel damn great about where I'm at in my career. I'll say Love that. It. It's more of the personal side of things. Like, have I traveled enough? Have I done enough? I don't know. Yeah. Like you said, we'll, we'll, we'll have some conversations when you're driving for, you know, when, when you're, yeah, it'll be offline, offline yeah. combos. All right. Uh, if, if you're uh, watching live, you want to drop a uh, sewer chat, we will try to get anything um, that you have. Uh, head to blueandgold.com, all your coverage for Notre Dame football. Of course, all right, that's some of the housekeeping items out of the way. So for today's show, we're kind of doing a state of the union on the offense. We're going to run through the positions. Goolsby's going to give his take. Um, I may or may not agree with him. We will see on those items. And then uh, we have a conversation with uh, former Notre Dame tight end um, Anthony Fasano. Um, and uh, a Dolphins great as well as a diehard Dolphins fan. Pretty excited about um, yeah, man. Fasano onto the show. Um, so, yeah, we'll go through those positions, bring Fasano on, and it will have a great time. So, uh, Mike, we're going to start on the offensive line. Um, you ha you have your bookends returning. Joe Alt, left side, Blake Fisher, right side. I think that's that's pretty much locked in. On the interior, you have Zeke Carell, center. Um, I know he's he's played some guard, but he's he's center now. Um, and Billy Shrouth, Andrew Kristoffic, Rocco Spindler, maybe Michael Carmody. Like so, those are the four names that you're hearing at guard. Um, personally, Mike, I'm going Fisher, Shrouth, Carell, Kristoffic, Fisher from left to right. That that's kind of what I like. But I don't know. I'm just curious what what you think about the offensive line. Yeah. I think my answer, Michael, is going to be contingent on what Blake does in 2024. So does Blake leave after this year and enter the draft? It'd be fun. You know, you got a championship level quarterback in 2024. We've talked about this, Michael. But uh, I think if you could convince Blake to come back and play left tackle, and I'm going to get to the guard question. Yeah. That guy, Blake Fisher, might pocket another five, ten million dollars. He can show the NFL he can play both sides. Obviously, you know, left tackle is a premier position in terms of the draft is concerned. So I just think there's a lot more meat on the bone, a lot more money to be made if I'm Blake. I try to start planting that seed in my head now. Okay. And I say that because it's like next year we've got probably the best tackle tandem in the country. And it could be a potential waste. I like. I'd love to bring the one back in in Blake, and with that, this might be a great year to roll in some youth and some like some guys that are a little different at the guard position. Mike um, Christophic to me, he's uh, you know he's been around forever, right? He's played a ton of football, but if like if you look up his bio right on like our Notre Dame's website, like he's kind of a career backup. Like it's not a knock per se. Um, but the guy's been here forever. And I just like, to me, I almost want to get somebody, whether it is a Rocco Spindler or whether it's a Shrouth, whether it's a Charles Jagasaw, 
right? I mean, he's kind of out of the conversation. He's not an early enrollee, but I want somebody that's a, a, a difference maker, somebody that's, you know, and again, just a, a little bit different, you know, categorically, I'd put Shrouth there. Um, you want to put Rocco there based off his recruiting rankings. I want to put Jagasaw there. You know, Mike with with Coach Rudolph coaching O line now. Um, looking at his past out of Wisconsin, namely, you're going to see more pulling from our guard. So there should be a little bit more of an emphasis on like overall athleticism. Um, so could you see like an Emil Wagner play spot duty at guard? You know, I've heard good things, and maybe he's not big enough. If we're going to consider Carmody is is in the running at 280, why why couldn't you consider you know Wagner there? Just throwing stuff out there. Do you like Jagasaw's long-term potential on the inside? I was just texting Tim Hyde about this prior to going on there because I value his O-line opinion. Jagasaw, to me, is almost like a little bit too barrel-chested singer to play tackle. I just not, not to say that he couldn't do it, but it just his body type seems more fitting to me um, to play inside, and I just think there's an opportunity there, again, like with your two bookends – if I've got a three-year starter in Joe Walt and all the, you know, the, the lineage there and the genetics, you know, his dad's an all-pro, et cetera, why couldn't you plug in a true freshman next to a guy like all with all of that just built in inherent experience? I think it'd be it's it's manageable. You know, if you if you put and then the other thing is real quick, Mike. Yeah. If you play Christophic or even like Carmody for that example, and then Blake and Alt leave. Then you lose Carell and you lose Kristoffic. So they're going into 2024. You're going to have to replace four starters on the offensive line if that was, you know, your lineup, right? Kristoffic, Blake, Joe, Carell. So, like, when I'm picking these spots or when I'm picking my starter, I have to consider 2024 to a degree as opposed to trying to go, you know, all in in, in, in 2023. I, you, you I'm, I'm curious to learn more about the mindset you have because it's <laughs> even when you're talking about quarterback, Mike, you're like, all right, let's look ahead to 2024. So you're talking about breaking a new starter now. What's the difference between breaking in the new starters then? Like you're, you're going to have fall camp and spring ball to integrate and, and let these guys learn. So I guess you're saying you want more experience for next year and you have that happen by playing – the younger guys now, but I just, I don't know. I you know, I get it. I get it. So let me try and, and I, yeah, I absolutely get it. I guess what I'm saying is when I look at the team holistically, brother, mm -hmm. I just feel like, and we're going to get up, we're going to touch on the wide receiver group. I just feel like the wide receiver group is, has another year of polish, another year of experience, right? In 2024, I don't see much difference in 2022 and 2023 in terms of the wide receiver room. They're still, still yeah. very much unproven. So it's like holistically as a team, uh, like even defensively, like what are you going to lose? Maybe Cam Hart defensively speaking. You know, I just feel like that the players on the roster are primed for 2024. I feel like 2023 is going to be kind of a, a feel it out season just to me. I just, I just do. And then, like I said, with as, as it pertains to the offensive line, um, it's painful to break in four new starters. So if you, you want to take a guy that has like the potential, like the start, the body type, the athleticism, the physicality, sure. He's going to make some mental errors, but then let's prime that pump for 2024 versus 2023. Okay. I just look at it kind of like holistically. And then again, like if you do have a guy, you know, with as much experience, experience as Sam Hartman has, I don't pretend to understand, you know, all of the ins and outs of pass protection, but can he help, you know, in terms of like understanding protections, it's just a, you know, a nice kind of luxury to have behind center. Okay. You know, if you did have somebody make a couple busts mentally this year with a younger player. Any, anything else on offense line? You're going to move on to tight end. Last thing. I just think that Notre Dame has tended to recruit, and maybe this will answer your question too. Notre Dame, as far as linemen, has to tended to recruit a bunch of like just kind of guys, you know, they're just kind of guys like, you know, and then you see like some of these outliers, like you, you got an alt and you got a Blake Fisher. And I mean, categorically, I'd put Charles Jagasaw in there just in terms of the, the, just somebody that's 
gifted. Yeah. Um, and those are the guys that we want to see play. We want to see those guys get drafted, kick off recruiting, et cetera. Okay. So Joe Walt's a guy. That's my guy. Yeah, man. Tight ends. I'm curious about your take on this group. Um, spring ball wise, it doesn't seem like a one that we're, we're we're super fired up about right now, just because there's not a lot of guys out there. What do you what, what are your vibes about this position, Mike? That's true. So yeah, I mean, Mitch has had dealt with a couple. You know, he's dings over the course of the spring. I think he hyperextended elbow, so he hasn't gotten as many reps as you wanted. And Mitch, to me, Mitch Evans, of course, I've touched on this before on the show. I always thought the conditioning was a little bit of an issue with him in terms of just cleaning up his body and just really looking like a pro. Um, and I think a lot of these spring reps would be conducive to that. But um, who replaces Michael Mayer? He's kind of irreplaceable. I tallied up last year basically everybody that's caught a pass that's still on the roster. Mitch caught three. I mean, I won't run through the whole thing. Colsey had nine catches. Tobias, one. Holden stays, one. Bauman, three. Right? Tobias. 77 total catches out of the returners last year. Mayor had 67. So, I mean, you're losing your offense. 67 I mean, of how many? Mayor had 67 last year. And I'm talking between, real quick, yeah. Mitch, Jane Thomas, Colsey, Salerno, Tobias, Holden stays, Lorenzo, okay. Bauman, 77 in total. And those are all your returners. Returning, you know, yeah. Lindsay had a few. He's gone, et cetera, right? right? Um, so I don't know. I mean, this is a bigger conversation of what is the offense going to look like. I mean, I think it's going to be a combination of – I think Jaden Thomas is a really unique player. And from all reports, he almost looks like – you know, physicality-wise, he almost seems like a shorter wide receiver in terms of, like, his, his build, his bulk. So a combination of uh, – Jaden Thomas, Holden stays is probably a better athlete, you know, in the in the passing game than Mitch Evans is, and he's going to get a lot of run obviously this spring with you know such low numbers at the position, and then I think strangely, Mike, I think um, Tyree could be a bit of a replacement for Mayor, and specifically when it comes to like mismatches. Okay, you know. I mean, if you if you come out in a two back, he's not a wide receiver, folks. Like, he's just not. He's still a running back. To me, though, you're going to see a lot of motion, God willing, and create a mismatch with a linebacker. Kind of those one on one scenarios that we saw with Mayor. Yeah. And I think this spring is just to get Chris Tyree kind of acclimated to just running routes, running routes, running routes. Right. I kind of like the idea of him being used as a pass catching H back. I love it. Just. In the flats, I mean, you're not going to ask him to block a DN, but yeah, I kind of like the idea of that. Get him in space, and he's a mismatch guy. So it's like, you know, if you come out and whatever personnel, I guess you'd come out in 21 personnel, but it ends up being 11 mm -hmm. because he's kind of our motion guy. I like that. I'm not trying to cover Chris Tyree in space. That's always so one of my favorite topics is to hear you talk about how you would try to tackle Chris Tyree. Being a 6'4", 235-pound linebacker. I was too, dude, I was 249 as a senior. So it's like, oh yeah, dude. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. yeah You're bigger tough, than Emil Wagner. <laughs> hope and a prayer, man. Okay. All right, moving along. Yeah, tight ends. Uh, but, you know, what? one more thing on the tight ends, Mike. Let's say opener. Who who, who do you think is tight end one? Oh, like Mitch Evans? Mitch. It's got to yeah? be Mitch. Mitch and then... Stays and then reared in kind of an X factor, considering when he's able to come back. Correct and yes, agreed. I do believe, and I think I've mentioned this before on here. You know, when Eli Raritan was recruited, it's my understanding that he was kind of like pre-anointed, like you're you're the next one. Yeah, you know, what I mean, who hell? I mean, even Cooper Flanagan could get in the mix, but I do think it's going to be a big departure from what we saw last year where it's like, shoot, you'd have two, three, four tight ends on the field. I think this year it's, you're going to see one, if not two on a handful of occasions. Yeah. Eli's a stud. Um, yeah. It's just one of those things like, bro, take your time. There's no rush. Get back healthy. Yep. Right. Let's talk about receivers before we uh, 
you move this thing along to the Fasano interview. And you touched on this a little bit earlier, Mike. My, my, my kind of question to you is, is the position better than it was a year ago? And uh, it seems to be maybe. Well, what, what do you think? Well, I try and make it a point to bring up a different, unique perspective, right? Even mm-hmm. if I'm patently wrong, I, I'm still going to say it. All right. I think that talent-wise, the receiver room is the same, maybe marginally better. Again, like as I just read through, like the catches, et cetera, like there's still no experience. Some of these penciled in like starters, like you've got Colsey kind of penciled in as a your boundary receiver starter. I don't believe that. I don't buy that. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to, I'm biting my tongue because I got a little bit of a conspiracy theory holstered. But uh, oh, geez. <laughs> but uh, I don't see that happening. I mean, Colsey's played a lot of football for the Irish. He played in 11 games as a true freshman. Had four catches. Had nine last year. I just don't see it now. To but snaps. The question, How many snaps? I feel like it's got to be a back, and I'm going back. To this is again. Tim and I have a lot of conversations via text message. I question Dion's love of the game, like, and I could see it in his high school film. It was kind of like he was so big and so fast. It was kind of lazy, like running under balls. It was all easy stuff. And I want to make this point. I think a Rico Flores. I think a Jaden Greathouse in particular, and even to an extent of Braylon James. I think, especially with Rico and, 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 and Great House, with, with their wiring and their level of compete and their confidence and the programs they came out of, I think having those young kids in the room, it's put up or shut up for a Deion Colsey. I think those young kids in the room, their personality types, Mike, are going to raise the level of play. It has to because Lorenzo's style strikes me as kind of a mouse-like personality. It doesn't seem very boisterous, you know what I mean? Um so I think in that regard, yes, the, the the receiver room might be in a better place than it was okay. a year ago. Great house is not a big talker, not 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 a big personality. Braylon James is, and I think Rico Flores is. Well, I'm just saying the personality, sure, but I'm saying like when you put like, do you think that do you think that Great House could go play in the boundary? Yes. Like, is it ideal? Who knows. Do I think that Rico Flores could go play in the boundary? Yes. Is it ideal? Who knows? Because they'll go compete for the damn ball. You understand? Okay. So like, everybody about- wants that 6'4", you know, statue S boundary receiver. But if if he ain't going to be 6'4", it's like, well, give me a guy that's 6'1", 6'2", that's going to go compete. So you think they're these guys are going to play their hair on fire, and that's why it's going to raise the I just know they're going to compete. I know that. Like, And that's what we saw with Rico. It's like, yeah, he might be a – you know, half a step slower than you want, but the dude goes up and gets the ball. So when you said your conspiracy, you you gave us your conspiracy. Oh no, no, no. Oh gosh. Okay. So the Colsey thing's not even I would push back on that. I don't know. I, I saw him in high school and he played single A private ball. So the lowest one of the lowest balls I think in in the state of Georgia, you know, single A private and it was easy and they did win like every single game. But also, you know, he's huge and he's more of a strider. So I think that also kind of plays a role in it. I don't know. I, I would push back on that, but um we're talking contested catches. I think I think in the SC game, like he made an effort for a ball. And that was, I mean, that was the first time that I had seen that. I mean, I'm rooting for it, but I'm just saying, like, if I'm like Italian a talent evaluator, I've looked at your film since your freshman year. If I'm going to draft you, Dion, that's a question that I want to answer is how much do you love the game? How much do you love to compete? Because that high school stuff, Mike, I mean, you know it. I mean, it's formative for kids, right? I mean, that's kind of where you sort of create your identity as a and your character as a football player. So if we're going to talk like four lead receivers for this season, Caleb Smith, the senior from Virginia Tech, maybe Jaden. I mean, it, a lot of talent. Because if you're going to make me pick four – you know, Lorenzo Stiles and Colsey are in that discussion. So is Jaden Thomas. So is Tobias Merriweather. And then you have one of the true freshmen, um, three early enrollees that you've touched on. And then Caleb Smith, no relation to the Virginia Tech guy. Um, you know, you always have at Notre Dame, at least in the past few years, you always have a, uh, a summer enrollee surprise. Could it be Caleb Smith? I wouldn't rule that out. So 
Oh, I think the surprise hell, is James. Hell, even throwing Matt Salerno in there, maybe he, maybe he's, you know, plays probably well. not. But you know, uh, Tyler Buckner was throwing to him against Ohio State last year. But um, I think that Braylon James is going to be the surprise, just because of the speed. You know, again, if Hartman's going to be your quarterback, we like deep balls. Everybody jumps to Tobias Merriweather, but he had one catch. You know, as a true freshman, and obviously you can see the talent. Mike, but you know, the talent has to produce and that's kind of where we're at, right? We got big, beautiful athletes. They can run, they can jump, but who's going to come down with the ball. And especially with Hartman style of play, back shoulder fades, et cetera. I mean, that's a big component of that is that level of compete. And I mean, the weight of the world is on this poor kid. Tobias. Yeah. Holy hell. I mean, he has one catch and you know, people think he's going to catch 60 balls this year. Um, so I think there's a lot of interchangeability at the wide receiver position. Um, I think I could see Braylon James popping just because I, I know he can run and he'll go get it. Um, this kid can run and get it. I yeah. like Tobias as the as an impact guy. I, I do. Oh, yeah. Well, way to step out on a limb, Singer. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's well, the you- other thing, too. Like – because I went back and I was watching Braylon, Braylon James's film before we came on. Braylon played in Texas too, mm-hmm. right? So like, I'm just talking like a higher level of like acumen, just like understanding it. I mean, playing in Washington, it's just going to be a different vibe coming out of high school where it might take him a, another year or two to like catch up. Okay. If you're going to go off based on that, I would go Jaden Greathouse playing at Austin Westlake and that mini college I went to one of their workouts a few years ago. Uh, Notre Dame was looking at a quarterback there, Club Nick, who's Clemson starter. Notre Dame's looking at him. And uh, it was a 5 a.m., 6 a.m. workout, and just how good that workout was, I'll never forget it. I mean, just, just routes on air. No one's messing around. Maybe yeah. Screwing around. That, like that, I was like, oh, crap, this looks like a college. No, and I, I mean, in Great House, a great, I saw Great House do an interview early in the spring. And he called, referred to as Kenny Minchie as a sweet kid. And That's it a really Mike jumped Woolsby out line. Of me. Huh? That's a Mike Woolsby line. Yeah, but I'm like 40 years old. I'm not a classmate of his, right? Right. To, right. to, to your point. And I was like, wow, Great House is calling like maybe his future quarterback a sweet kid. And that to me just spoke to Jaden's level of confidence, right? I mean, Jaden's, I don't think Jaden's going to be content to not get on the field. All right. Anything else in receivers, Mike? Sky's the limit, but Sky's very much an unknown. And last thing, yeah, last thing. Thanks for asking. Since Tyler's given Sam a run for his money during spring, it seems like we're going to touch on this. Don't let me, uh, you know. All right. I'm not. I'm, <laughs> uh, but it seems like there's almost some Sam Hartman apologists that are coming out of the woodworks or coming to the forefront. It's like, well, the receiver's got to make more plays, and like, it's like whatever. So, uh, if if we if we see a, a lack of wide receiver production, I don't want to put it on them. It's got to be that blame's got to be equally shared between our quarterback and them. What was it that you said before you you went on your opening discussion about the receiver? Something about you'll be wrong, but you'll stick with it just to oh yeah stick with it. So I don't know, Mike. Sometimes on the this whole Buckner. Hartman thing some 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 part of me is like I I just am curious how much of his takes are skewed by his love for Tyler Buckner and hate for anything that opposes Tyler Buckner hey I'm just saying I've I've said it before I when like when you kind of get into Tyler and his background and all this stuff I'm like something about that kid he seems different he seems special to me he just does and I mean I think you're seeing some of that with the way he's competing this spring but also, Mike, also, Mike, let's not lose sight of the fact that this is a podcast. Um, this is for entertainment purpose purposes, right? So if I can mix it up and you like to mix it up, it's good fun. All right. Well, let's let's mix it up and have good fun before we move into our next segment. The point about Tobias Merriweather playing in Washington, not the best ball. And then you got Tyler Buckner playing in you know, little baby ball, San Diego, private league, you know, but, but did, Buckner. He, for sure. Valid argument, but he did, uh, he did transfer to try and up the level of play. Right. 
I do. Yeah, I do. I've always respected that. I really wish we could have seen that senior year. That would have been so much fun. Yeah. That's and where did, where did Hartman play in the Carolinas or something in high school? I assume. Oceanside Collegiate, I believe it's called in Mount Pleasant. Yeah, it's, it's actually it's decent. It's I think it's one of the top teams in South Carolina. I'm yeah, not. So I mean, if you right. pulled up, but if you pulled up the two of their like a their highlight films, I saw the episode you did with Tim most recently where you're talking about you know comparing highlight films, what have you. Look at Hartman's offer sheet. Look at Buckner's offer sheet. Look at the star ranking, yeah, yeah. etc. I mean, I, I know Sam was on Netflix as a you know high school senior. Tyler doesn't have that in his bag, yeah. but. It was it was pretty awesome seeing you drop that super chat. That, we got a good laugh out of that, and then I was like, was "Oh totally man, I haven't been too. too kind towards Tyler. Mike might, might be mad at me." But no, but again, I mean, I'm just I'm a I'm a fan of whoever our starting quarterback is. But I just for for a lot of reasons, um, even Drew I'm willing Pine to die on that hill for Tyler, and I may end up being right. Even a fan of the starting quarterback last year for most of it, I was rooting for him. <laughs> All right, so uh, what we're going to do next is uh, hear from Anthony Fasano. Really good interview. Uh, former teammate um, of Mr. Gould's. We've had some awesome guests on the show. We've had Aaron Taylor. We've had Chris Zorch on multiple times. Brady Quinn, Zibby, Fasano. Um, heck, I think like two, three years ago, we had on Preston Jackson, um, a guy who I've you know followed – um, you know, doing with his work in Tampa, big county, I was preps, growing up. Yeah, big county preps, just big county give preps. A quick shout out. Yeah. Yeah. So some awesome guests and, uh, Anthony Fasano for me was, uh, was, was a big one. And, and we'll talk about that in, in just a moment. Um, but first let's go ahead and hear from our sponsors over, um, at Augie's locker room, which is folks, you know, it, um, as the memorabilia place for everything. Notre Dame football. If you want to complete that rec room and get that special Notre Dame item, head over to augieslockerroom.com. They have Notre Dame stadium pieces, jerseys, helmets, autographs, one of a kind rock items, Joe Montana signed items, famous sculptor, Jerry McKenna's miniature replicas of the bronze statues around the stadium. Seriously, folks, one of a kind stuff. And if foggy doesn't have it in store, he will find it for you. Go to augieslockerroom.com or if you're in town, stop in at 1811 South Bend Avenue and see the vintage helmet display dating back to 1890. Augieslockerroom.com. Give them a call, 574-277-NDND. All right, without further ado, let's hear from um, Anthony Fasano. And joining us on this week's episode, really needs no introduction, but his name is Anthony Fasano. Second round pick in the 2006 NFL draft by the Dallas Cowboys, Mackey Award finalist, and really the man who started tight end U tradition at Notre Dame, if I may say that. And I also want to add one of my favorites, all-time Miami Dolphins. You know, when I people ask me, what's your favorite Miami Dolphins memory? As a, as a Finns fan, it is this one right here, the Wildcat game in 2008. This has to be one of your favorite touchdowns in a Dolphin uniform, I'm guessing, right, Anthony? Yeah, it is. It's uh, it's a play that gets brought up a bunch, but uh, it's one I'll, I'll remember for a long time. I love that. What was it? Uh, so your quarterback back then was Pennington, yes? Yeah, so that year, it was 08. It was my first year in Miami after getting traded from Dallas. And we started off 0-2, and I didn't, no one knew where we were going. On a plane ride home from Arizona, um, the coaches kind of, you know, told a couple of guys that they're going to implement it this week coming up, and I was in New England. And uh, I said, oh, oh, boy, like, we're getting pretty desperate now. This is this is problematic. Uh, and this is after a 1-15 in season that Miami had. So I thought I got traded to, uh, you know, a, a long couple of years, but uh, that really sparked us and, and turned it around. We had a great um, personnel for it. And um, Ronnie was a lefty. So I don't think anybody expected us to roll out to the left and uh, he threw a great ball. So, you know, and it got a lot of credit, but we only used it a couple of times a game, but uh, you know, it was really the wildcat year. And uh, it, it really made defenses spend some time preparing for that wrinkle, even though we didn't run it too often. So, but, in, uh, yeah. the, the, year, the year before, Arkansas did it with Darren McFadden, or maybe it was that year. They did it in college, and then the Dolphins were the first to do it in the NFL. And then, yeah, 
that ever then everyone was copycat league in the NFL, right? Everyone started doing it. And uh so here's an interesting thing. The Dolphins made the playoffs, of course, that year. You guys lost in the first round. I can't remember. Steelers, maybe? Or Ravens? Uh, yeah, Ravens. Dolphins then made the playoffs eight years later. <laughs> Dolphins haven't won a playoff game in, since I was seven years old. Like, it's 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 tough as a Dolphins fan these days. But uh, Anthony is, is one of my – I mean, we, we've had some big-name guys on the show, Mike. I mean, obviously, you, Mr. Goolsby, Aaron Taylor, Brady Quinn. This one's the coolest for me as a, uh unfortunate, lifelong Dolphins fan. Um, yeah, my favorite – play as a fence fan is that one but well it's getting better uh, i'm uh, i have a lot of high hopes for the dolphins coming up so uh it's uh all your all your bad fortune is going to come around in the next couple of years but you know how many times i've i've had that feeling anthony it's like oh this is this is it oh joe philbin's here now how, how exciting yeah yeah um, you know like that years i mean it's always something but we're not here to talk miami dolphins well a couple follow-up questions so anthony you're you live down in florida yes yes so do you, in terms of the four teams that you had played for in the league, are you the most connected still with Miami? Would that be the case because of the geography? Yeah, and uh, I played here uh, six out of the 12. So it's, uh, you know, it's definitely where I call home now um, and raise our family. So I'm involved in the, the Miami Dolphin the alumni and, and do a lot of the philanthropic things for them and, and keep connected to the program, which which they're great at. Um, they're really Stephen Ross and the Dolphins have, have done a really good job uh, keeping the players connected to the program. I love that. I love that. So jumping into it, bud. Um, yeah, you know, when I'm doing this show and it's the off season, right? So there's there's not a lot of just you know game week to week kind of fodder or things to things to discuss. So I'm I'm trying to make it kind of a mission of mine to bring on guys that I know, guys that I'm connected to, like yourself. There were Notre Dame greats. Um, yeah, I had Zibby on, Brady on, Aaron Taylor, obviously. Um, in, I, I think it's important, and this is like selfish. I wanted to bring you on. We talked about this offline. Is like you were the guy, and Singer alluded to it earlier. You were the guy that really kicked off this run. For folks that don't know, every tight end that started, and Anthony included, at Notre Dame has been drafted. When you were recruited out of New Jersey. Was that part of like the sell to Notre Dame? I mean, because there's a Ken McAfee, right? There's uh, was Darren Brown, you know. There's Dave Ca Dave Casper, Bavaro, right? It, you know, a lot of comps with you and Bavaro. Was that part of the sell? You know, I, I had a, uh, a a different recruiting experience, and and also I think I was on the cusp of when players were still making decisions on what school and program they wanted to play for versus what program can get me to the NFL as fast as possible. So um, I came from a small public school and, uh, you know, really no one has come out of my school uh, to, to make it to a big program. So I had that, that notion in the back of my head where I just, I was fortunate to have these scholarships and opportunities and, and wanted to go and, and play the best football I could, but also knowing that if it didn't work out, um, having a good education with a good network was really important to me. So the whole um, 40 instead of four um, w was a big thing for me. Um, and looking back, I, I committed to Bob Davey and his offense. And really, if I, if I wanted to be a pro-style tight end, that, that was not the system for me at all. So the choice of going to Notre Dame really spoke that I was not looking – to go and, and find my quickest way to the NFL, but to really go and, and go to the school I wanted to go in the program I wanted to go. So committed to Bob Davey. Uh, he got fired my senior year in high school. George O'Leary was hired and fired before I ever met him. Um, and then Tyrone Willingham got, got hired. I, com I stayed committed to him, played for him for three years and then one for Charlie Wise. So, um, no, no. When that decision was on me, it was not, hey, they're, they're a tight end factory. I can get to the NFL from here. It was truly, I want to go to Notre Dame and experience everything Notre Dame is. And, um, you know, we'll see where football takes me from there. So you were truly committed. I mean, the guy that recruits you get fired, the whole, just a mess. And, you know, and I was on campus during all that. It was like those three days that O'Leary was here, the two weeks we didn't have a coach. I, I kid now, but it was like Lord of the Flies. I mean, it was 
you know, madness because <laughs> we had, you know, we had no leadership as a football team. So that was crazy to live through. But um, there's a lot to kind of unpack there. And I want to talk about those coaching changes that you experienced because I think that's relative, you know, relative or uh, to the program now with Coach Freeman. But like you get there, you see the 40 for 40 thing. It's the holistic approach to kind of picking a school. When did the NFL opportunity, like, the realization when did that become like crystallized to you during your time at MB? Because you didn't start till what your junior year, like you became like a full time starter. Or am I off there? I don't quite remember. Um, well, I, I did take my red shirt year, okay. uh, the first year in Willingham. Uh, I red shirted and, and really gets Notre Dame. And, and like I said, coming from a small public school, there's really not that much competition. So I get to a, a crowded Notre Dame tight end room. Um, and it, you know you're in you're in the deep end, and you know you slowly start you know working your way up the, the depth chart and learning how the program and, and the game is run, and um, you start to realize it. You know, oh, okay, I think I'm better than this guy. I'm better than that guy. Coach wants me to do this. I can do that. And um, I started playing a little bit sporadically on, on special teams and getting some snaps at tight end my, my sophomore year or my, my redshirt freshman year. Um, and then really when Brady Quinn started with playing, I, I kind of came up uh, along with him, even though he was a year younger than me. So really towards the end of my sophomore year um, and going into my junior year, there was uh, you know some clarity on, on where the path could be if everything worked out. Got it. Because I do think, and I want to talk on Michael Mayer, you know, because I think he's widely considered now statistically like, oh, he's the, the best to ever do it at Notre Dame. But like, uh, yeah, again, I look at like my boy Fasano, like if you look at those stats, you did, you put up numbers over really over two years, two and two years and some change. Um, and there's a lot of similarities, I think, between you guys as players. But, you know, looking back on your career now, maybe more of a focus on ND or at your time at ND, what made you special? Like if, whether it's a physical thing that you were able to do well, whether it was like a, a mental thing, your, your makeup, how would you answer that? Yeah, it's tough. And it's probably easier looking back um, now than it was at the time. Sure. But going back um, and I learned this actually more in the NFL and a lot of it came from, from Bill Parcells. But uh, you had to be really good at one thing and pretty good at a couple other things. And for me, that was blocking and really um, hanging my hat with blocking. I know it was kind of a dying breed when I was coming in. A lot of athletic wide receiver type tight ends, slot tight ends were starting to become in vogue. Um, and that just wasn't me. No matter, no matter what I did or how I trained, it really wasn't me. So, so hanging my hat on blocking. And then really being um, really sound mentally, because, you know, aside from quarterback, tight end is really carries the weight mentally as far as the playbook and week by week game plans going in and things shifting. Um, so so really being trying to be flawless uh, on the mental side of the game and, and then just slowly get my technique better. You know, mm -hmm. you're going against 280 pounds, 300 pounds, super athletic, strong guys and the outside linebacker DM position. And I'm, most of the time overmatched. Um, so, uh, you know, getting your technique down was super important for me and, and, and uh, making that my craft year in and year out, trying to get a little better each year is really what, uh, what allowed me to play a long time. That's what, yeah, that's what helps you stick around. Cause you were interesting. Cause to me, man, it was like, you were an H back. Sometimes if even in the NFL, I feel like they used you almost as a true fullback lead blocker, you were detached. You had your hand in the dirt. You could really do it all as a, uh, you know, as like, as you said, as a blocker and be a very serviceable guy in the passing game. And I think that's some similarities to mayor. I mean, do you see that? Uh, we talked about, I mean, your familiarity with the program, but I, I, I'm, I'm going to presume that you've seen quite a bit of film of Michael mayor. Do you have any thoughts on him just overall as a prospect? Yeah, he's really a, a throwback player in, in the modern game. And um, he had a great career. I think he's he's probably one of the best in the last multiple decades in, in being able to do it all. And I think he's going to have uh, a very long NFL career because of sure. that. 
you know, and he needs to, you know, have some luck and stay healthy and get into good situations as far as offenses and coaches, quarterbacks. But um, his talents alone and what he can control, uh, he has a very bright future. And uh, I really enjoyed watching him play because as much as the receiving tight ends and fast guys are, are fun to watch and, and fantasy and the whole deal, I mean, really, a, a tight end that can do it all is super valuable for a team and will be valuable. You know, having having to stay on the field for uh, all three downs, uh, mm -hmm. being able to pass block, run block, not really give away, but also have a mismatch on defense in the pass game, uh, very valuable to offense. And I, I think that's what he serves. Uh, and from from what I, I've heard, he's, uh, he's A-plus in the locker room uh, and just one of those clubhouse guys. So... Um, Everything, everything is uh, super positive and bright future. I'm happy, you know, kind of to uh, to be in the same Irish tight end uh, uh, pool as him. Absolutely, yeah. It's kind of why we're here. Yeah. He got, so it doesn't sound like you've ever met Mike. You know, uh, during COVID, uh, we did some zooms, and, and I, uh, I participated with the tight end room. Um, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. And I, I wanted the, the tight end coach at the time at Notre Dame was an old uh, coach on one of my NFL teams, and. This is yeah, McNulty. Uh, McNulty, you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And okay. uh, we were together in Tennessee, and he, he had the job, and they were in COVID, trying to fill time on Zoom. So I got on and got to meet a couple of guys uh, and talk and just share my experience, uh, what what I would have done, what I suggest to do, and it was pretty cool. I love that. I love that. Uh, could you could you elaborate a little bit more? I think people would be interested. To, so we're in. Yeah, we're in COVID. Everybody's kind of limited as to what you can do. What does he just give you the floor via Zoom call and say, talk to these boys? Or what did you get into? Yeah, just he said, you know, you know, tell the guys what it's like to be, uh, you know, Irish tight end, what it takes. What's what are some of the things that, you know, were really beneficial for you? Um, you know, and and kind of being a pro was really what uh, I think the theme of it was. I had to be a pro. And even though even though you're in college and you have. Um, different responsibilities, you know, handling yourself in the building and, and outside the building like a pro is, is super important and, and will go a long way. And that's something that I learned from, honestly, Jason Witten. Uh, my first two years in Dallas um, was just learning your routine, um, really concentrating and focusing in your job, you know, whenever you're in the building and, and bringing other guys around you, um, you know, to to participate in, in that extra work and getting that routine down. So that's what I stressed. Um, I think uh, I was happily labeled, you know, a pro's pro in, in the NFL, just the way I went about every day, not missing a lot of games, practices, not bitching and moaning like a lot of guys do, um, while still being a good teammate, you know, and a guy's guy. I, I think it was, a, you know, kind of developed, but also innate in me. But uh, I just stress that to the guys, you know, it's, it's you go have fun, you know, have that camaraderie, but uh, take this as a business because it's, it's serious still. I would. I, yeah, I would agree in terms of like that personality trait with you, like rock solid dude. I met Mike Mayer last spring when Coach Freeman had asked some ex players to come back. Um, it was a nice weekend, but I got a chance to Dave Peliquin, who's still with the program. And, you, you know, Dave, he pulled uh, Mike aside and we chatted for like five minutes and just he is such a stud, bro. Like he's just a stud. And he was like very humble, uh, just a super impressive thing. And you, know, you talk about that being a pro kind of mentality, handling your business, the mental aspect of the game. Well, we're going to talk about the tight end position, you know, in the NFL coming out of Notre Dame, but how much weight, you know, in your time in the league, how much weight do you think an NFL front office puts in that professionalism, maturity, discipline, Etc. You know, I like to use that pie chart analogy. I mean, is that twenty five percent of a pie chart in terms of them evaluating a signee or a draft pick? Would be draft pick. Yeah, it, it, I don't. It would be tough for me to put a percentage value on that, but I know it can overcome uh, a lot of deficiencies that that one might think um, because uh, you know if someone is not a pro, or if they're labeled that you know, this guy, we're going to have to really bring him along or he's going to need some veteran influence for him to be able to make it. That, that's a big question mark. But if you know you have a hardworking, good person, good locker room guy, it will uh, it will go a long way because you'll be able to overcome a lot of things. And, 
you know, get better as your career goes on. So super valuable. Um, it might not matter with the supreme talent, you know, the, 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 they're dealt with sure. differently. And, and it, every team has a couple of them and have, have room for a couple of them. But, uh, you know, for a person in my position and, and you, pretty much the vast majority of the team cannot afford to not to not be a pro. So some of that's maybe I'll categorize that as like trust, you know, that that franchise ownership team GM on down, they establish trust. I'm going to try and make a corollary to Notre Dame and what some of these kids are going through now with spring ball. To me, this is one of those things that unfortunately you probably didn't realize till after you're you're gone, but like that's when you win your job to me. I don't know if you agree with that. So any college kid or kids that wants to play in college, that's when a lot of that hay is put in the barn. Then you get to training camp and then you're really trying to refine things. So, A, do you agree with that? That's when these kids are focusing on winning a job or moving up the depth chart spring ball. 100 percent. Yeah. Um, and, and when you said, you know, when did you think the NFL was kind of a likely path for you? Uh, and I knew we were going to talk about spring ball, but that's usually that's a time where the depth chart kind of clarifies itself a little bit more going into going into summer. Um, you know, anything can happen in camp injuries, uh, spectacular play or, 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 or bad play by somebody, but really the spring ball is pretty indicative of, of what the depth chart is going to look like. So, you know, having some spring, good springs for myself early in, uh, in my career there probably, um, you know, showed that I was, I, I could compete and that I would, uh, I would definitely, uh, get some playing time. Yeah. Like I said, it's. Cause I, you know, I train kids in the side ant and it's just like any of these college kids, they've got to think about it's like, it's that coach's livelihood. It's their family that moved to South Bend. So like establishing that trust, being a pro is just such a formative part of, you know, really fundamental part of, of, of winning a job. If that coach is going to trust you to, to kind of roll out there. So not at Notre Dame now, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, not only that. I mean, as, young, you know, 18, 19, 20 year old men, um, your body's changing a lot and, and you're putting a lot of work in, uh, in the weight room and in the indoor facility throughout the winter. And really the spring is the time for you to be able to show some of that work is paying off. I mean, the, like you said, the hay's in a barn come camp. Uh, you know, it, it's really time to get on the same page with the people you're going to be on the field with. It's really not time to, you know, build and and have great improvement. So you you have to have that and take those those jumps in the off season. Yeah. So sticking with coaching, you know, technically I guess you were involved with four different head coaches, you know, high school so when you graduated, but like all of us Notre Dame fans can remember the resurgence and you know, you were a part of that 02 team Willingham's first year. Maybe it was a little hokey. Yeah, we had a great defense, but like when Weiss came in, I can remember your all's first game. And I want us. Do you do you recall Weiss's first game? Was it against Pittsburgh? Off the top of your head, is that right? Yes, I remember. uh, Samarja made like a a laying out catch in the back of the end zone, and it was so. Julius Jones had two hundred yards rushing as well. I think. So I'm talking. We're talking Weiss's first game. You're right. Right. So Julius wasn't there. Wasn't he was, there. Yeah, yeah. He was, it was, me. Dude, it all. Yeah, it gets cloudy as we get older. I, <laughs> maybe, maybe Darius. It was Darius. Maybe it was Darius. There you go. But I just remember like the level of excitement when we that that offense rolled out. I mean, where did that kind of resurgence come through? You know, Willingham had a couple down years. You know, he's out the door. Weiss comes in. What do you attribute that? Like, you know, really, that confidence is how it kind of came through the screen watching the games on television, what do you, again, that resurgence, where did that come from? Yeah. Um, it's a good question because it's tough to put your finger on, but mm-hmm. and not skip over Willingham and his staff. We had a bunch of good players on the team and that, and that was because of Willingham and his staff's, you know, recruiting. We had a lot of good pieces to the puzzle. Um, and, and Charlie came in, just coming off the Super Bowl and had that bravado, um, 
just a Jersey guy with a little bit of attitude, didn't really have the, the all the corners rounded off and kind of gave, gave the team a sense of a little bit of freedom to be themselves okay. and, and has that pro mentality where, you know, we were dogs and we were, we were going to go out there and win. Uh, and, and there's no reason that we should settle for anything less. So that really, that bled through the team. Um, and, and at the end of the day, it was still a time where you needed a good quarterback. And Brady Quinn was on top of his game. We had the receivers. We had the leadership. Uh, guys that have been through a lot together throughout the team with coaching changes and whatever it might be. Um, you know, you're going through three years of, of, of college and not winning a lot of games. You're going to go through it. And everyone hung in there uh, and really came together that last year. I dig it. So I, I, I want to build on – what you had said about Weiss, he's an NFL guy, right? So, for, again, for those that don't know, like you refer to your position coach by his first name, right? It's not Coach Smith. It's, hey, John, what am I doing on this route, right? You're almost – you're you're more of a peer with your coach in the league, whereas in college it's not quite that. It's a little bit more subservient. But, you know, you had said that, like, he let you guys kind of be yourself and sort of be dogs. I've talked about this on this pod, bro, for like three years – there is an interesting element at a program like a Notre Dame where there's so many responsibilities put on your plate. I can I can always remember just being tired, dude. Like, you know, you know like just being tired. Uh, study hall, you know, you got a full day every day. Do um, you think that there's some validity to that, though? Like at the college level, man, like especially, Anthony, we're talking about big games like week four – uh, 2023 season, you know, we were playing Ohio State at home, presumably a night game. Um, yes, we want to have good kids. Yes, we want to have high academics. But, dude, this is still football, right? Could you talk about kind of like striking that balance, you know, maybe through your perspective as a player when you're there, maybe now in, in, in hindsight? Yeah, and I think it goes back to what we spoke about earlier about trust and being a pro's pro, right? If if Coach Weiss came in and said, okay, I got these leaders, I'm going to kind of hold a couple, a certain group of people accountable, but I'm going to let these leaders lead uh, and trust them to do so. And then bring my my kind of pro-style attitude to the team. I think it, I think it works as it did that year. But uh, when, when there's distractions and, and coaches worrying about other things off the field or in the classroom, it becomes difficult to, to really, um, you know, let the leash off and uh, sell out. Yeah. And it's, it's having leadership. I think, you know, not only from the coach on down, but also within the locker room and peer accountability. So um, that that's really in, in really playing for one another um, is in that synergistic, you know, attitude is really important. Um, I think it's kind of lost in the NFL now at free agency, but having a group of guys that have gone through some tough times and are playing for each other really outweighs individual talent and, huh. and getting that cohesiveness together. Uh, what we had at, at that year um, is super important and, and stuff that you can't really teach, you know, it just has to come over time and it happened to align for us. Got it. That's interesting. So I, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a, I'm going to use the term quarterback controversy at Notre Dame with our transfer with Sam Hartman. And then you've got a guy kind of waiting in the wings and Tyler Buckner. And I've always talked about, you know, I'm a pro Tyler Buckner guy. He's been in the program. I can see the potential. There's other folks that are in the camp of Sam Hartman. You know, he's a, he's played for five years at Wake Forest, put up a ton of numbers, but I'm, st I, I'm still, you know, I'm an ex captain. I'm a locker room guy. And I'm like, there's something to, building your program around your guys. And I think that it's, it's, it's going to be, I think like the transfer portal will kind of serve Notre Dame well going into the future. Cause we're only going to take a couple, we're not going to build a program around transfers. And I think you can still kind of maintain that culture that you're speaking of. Right. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, the game is entirely different than it was the, the structure of college football. Um, it's a lot different than, than uh, I think we were used to. But it, it is it is the structure and the game you have to play now. So I think Notre Dame has, has done exactly what Notre Dame, you know, was expected to do and needs to do and, and does it the right way. 
Um, I think we're set up well for the NIL. Uh, I think we're, we're fair considering, you know, what is needed in today's game. And uh, while still holding true to uh, really, really hold prioritizing our guys and guys that chose Notre Dame from the beginning um, while still competing and playing the game that, that needs to be uh, played on the elite level. So uh, Notre Dame is, is awesome at, uh, at, at doing those certain things. Gould, did you have anything else for Anthony? No, I was just going to segue into um, this, you know, week one Ireland kickoff. I know Anthony, you you're involved with a trip out there. Do you want to speak on that for a bit? Yeah, no, no, I don't want to um, plug it too much, but yeah, it's just a trip. Um, I think a lot of Notre Dame fans would like, and uh, I'll bring it up. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about. It. I think Ryan Ryan Grant's involved in it as well, and a couple other Notre Dame guys. Yeah, is it, now's your chance. He's yeah. Let's he's hear through yeah. the website, dude. Okay, so you cut it up. Um, so while I don't get back to Notre Dame and on campus much uh, for a lot of games, but uh, I am looking forward to the Ireland game. Uh, I've uh, in retirement really taken a liking to golf and try to play as much golf as possible. And uh, there's there's really no better place in Ireland and, and happen to go to a uh, Notre Dame Navy game as well. So. Uh, I was contacted by uh, J.P. Cohn and uh, a former teammate, Ryan Grant, who they work together on uh, global executive tours. They put together a great tour that includes some golf, but also some sightseeing and then uh, and takes their game. So uh, we'll be playing golf and uh, doing some sightseeing in Ireland. Uh, we're actually visiting a uh, American football uh, team that uh, Irish kids play on. So uh, looking forward to speaking with them. And then, uh, you know, seeing Notre Dame get a win overseas. So uh, we'll be doing that uh, late in August. And uh, we'll, we'll be uh, accepting any, any Notre Dame fans, anybody who wants to be a part of the trip. Uh, I think it would be a, a great way to, uh, you know, meet some Notre Dame greats and uh, get to see the game. All right. Well, I got the yeah, – uh, real uh, quick. Just real quick. Real I got quick, the bottom of the screen. I have uh, – Contact info for podcast listeners, jp at executiveglobaltours.com is the email. Go ahead, Ghouls. Uh, do you know, like, are so fans come over, they sign up for the trip, the package, etc. Are they like you guys crushing Guinness with them, playing golf, or did, what does that interaction yeah. look like? You know, yeah, so um, all the older players that are going over, um. We'll play golf with the, the, the Notre Dame fans and participants that have signed up for the trip. Uh, I think we have a, a scheduled dinner together. Um, we're all staying in the same motel and doing doing a, uh, a tailgate oh as well before the game. Nice. So, yeah, we'll be intimately involved with, with the whole group that signs up through uh, Global Executive Tours. Depends on the, the 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 bunch of guys that they're bringing over, but if y'all are staying in the same hotel, that could lead you know maybe those fans might be coming home with some stories, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe more than they bargained for. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Well, no, this is great, man. Anthony, I appreciate the time, man. Go Irish and and, and go Dolphins, right? Yeah. Well, thanks for having me, Mike. Uh, miss you, love you, brother. Yeah, love you back, dude. Yeah. All right, go Irish. Thanks. For I was me. hoping he was talking about me, Mike, but uh, that, that, that's okay. <laughs> appreciate it, Anthony. Yep. We'll see ya. All right. Later, Mike. All right. How about that? 30 minutes of straight gold, Mike. Am I on? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, yeah. It's good stuff. Yeah. I'm always amazed, Mike, when I do those, you know, interviews um, that people know what I'm trying to ask them. I'm, I'm, I bounce around so much in my brain and it's like, Oh yeah. He understood what I was trying to ask. Him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it helps that I know some of these guys are, you know, well, it, you do a lot on our show. Like, does that make sense? Mike, you're like, you're like, conf you want me to confirm. Am I making a good point? Like, am I speaking English? I don't, yeah, it like, doesn't even need to be a good point, brother. It just needs to be like a cohesive <laughs> statement half the time. Right. All right. So if you, if you guys are just joining us, um, we had obviously played the Fasano interview that uh, Mike and I did a, a couple days ago. Um, and before that, we talked about uh, a little bit of State of the Union, kind of Mike's thoughts about the O-line, tight ends, and receivers. We're going to finish up with running backs and quarterbacks. So, again, if you missed any of that stuff, just, just go back and watch it um, or, or, or listen. Forby Huggins said it's great Goolsby pulls his old teammates in and that they're willing. Team, yep, appreciate the super chat. Joey also said uh, – 
Buckner has the stones we need. Um, so uh, Joey Green is uh, very much in your camp. It, it, I will say, my, you know, the the YouTube comments and the message board fodder, it's very split. I, I think it might, I think you think it's a little bit more pro Hartman, and maybe it is, maybe it is. But I'm just telling you, like, I, I see all spectrums of it the middle, the far this end, the far that end. Fan base seems, yeah, pretty. Yeah. yeah. And at the end, of, and at the end of the day, none of it matters, right? I mean, it's not our call. Which is they're going to play who they're going to play. Wow, as a starter. But, um, yeah, I just feel like I'm kindred spirits with Tyler, and I just, you know, like the crux of my argument, I think one of the, the – and I don't want to derail this podcast, but like <clears throat> when Freeman came out and said we needed an experience at the quarterback position, that really chapped my ass <laughs> because, you know, you bring in a fifth-year guy, and it's like, well, Tyler's obviously starting in second, you know, a distant second place. Um, and then just, you know, the, the assumption that the guy walks on water, and, and Tim – to his credit, has done a great job, kind of char- great job charting some of his games. And I, I don't want to steal his thunder, but next time you have Tim on, he could really dive into the numbers of what Sam Hartman did against ranked teams, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's uh, shit ain't that sweet. It's not as sweet as people think. Tim the politician. I can't wait to hear. Uh... Oh boy, does he flip flop? <laughs> <laughs> right. But- you know, hey, hey, bringing him over, bringing him over to Tim uh, to Team Buckner might have been my best sales job I've ever done. It was impressive. Thank you. What about a kicker? Um, Spencer Schrader from USF is enrolling this summer. I think that's it. And then uh, the punter is um, another transfer, I believe. Walk on. They got a walk on transfer. Yeah, Tyler. Think- so just to just so Tyler knows, under Coach Freeman. They are completely separating themselves from like recruiting specialists. Yes. Like specialists will not be recruited. They're not going to spend time, money, money, resources on recruiting those guys. They're going to just stick to that t- trend of taking in a, a grad transfer. Yeah. Interested to see what Marty Biaggi does as the special teams coordinator in terms of recruiting because Mason, as a Zinesville native, just recruited Indianapolis and that was kind of his main thing. Or if, you know, um, you know, Marcus Freeman needed uh, someone to go with them. Because for, when Freeman does those home visits at the end of the year, he always has an assistant coach with him. So sometimes it would be Mason um, who would go with him different places. So interested to see what Biagi, like who's going to be the in-state guy. Is it is it still Biagi? Because, yeah, I, I always called him the the Brian Pullian special. In 2019, you know, the, the, the punter from Alabama. 2020, a long snapper. 2021 a kicker 2022 a punter like always these scholarship specialists i think those days are gone oh for I mean, maybe I've been told maybe here and there you know but i i think no, we were offering long snappers i mean those days are over you mentioned coach biagi versus coach mason the recruiting etc it hasn't been talked about in the off season but you know mason was kind of known for his punt block schemes right kind mm-hmm. of that's what got him to the nfl I'm dying to see a kick and or punt return. I don't know what you think is more impactful for a game, a punt return for a touchdown or we block a punt. Block a punt. Hmm. I think block a punt. I mean, if they're both touchdowns and who cares, you're you're both, the six points are equal. I just, I just, I, I've told the story before. My high school coach always said the team that blocks a punt wins eighty three percent of the time. I don't know if he pulled that stat out of his ass or what, but I, that always kind of stuck with me. And that was, you know, decade plus ago. Um, but I, I'm, I'm all right. Before we go to the running backs and quarterbacks, we've probably touched on this before, Mike. But it just seems to me like maybe not as much with kick return yet, but punt returns, it's kind of just trending out of the game. Like you're putting a Matt Salerno back there to fair catch. And don't screw up. I mean, if you go in for a punt block, maybe you hit the punter. That happens. But it seems like a little less risky than going for a punt return because you might muff it. Like that happens. I feel like that happens a good bit. Did you come up with that on your own? Or did you read that somewhere? That it's kind of getting phased out. Is that just your personal observation? 
Yes, it should. Is that <laughs> That's a, great. Is it good or not? I don't know. <laughs> Am I about to get roasted? No, it's a great observation. I that thought had never crossed my mind, and I think okay. you're 100 percent right. And I was like, yeah, he's right. It is getting phased out. In uh, well, in, I'm just seeing if if there are pigs flying outside or. Hey man, like a, <laughs> yeah, uh, every squirrel finds a nut. But I uh, good. no, it's a great point. Okay, it's a great point. But that doesn't mean we can't zig if everybody sure. else is zagging. Sure. I mean, I played on some teams like. You know, Julius Jones had some – Joey Gatherall was a world, world-class world punt returner. Julius Jones bringing kicks back against, like, you know, Nebraska. It's like – it's um, it's interesting. I think your high school coach was on to something. I do believe that there's data to back that. Ask Tim next time you see him. It's very much akin to, like, the winning the turnover battle in terms of the probability of who's going to win the game. But I'm just saying in terms of providing some electricity and some spark. Yeah. And it's almost sustained. Like if you can get a kick or a punt return, I just like to see it. I just yeah. would. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I think the, just the there's something about the punt block momentum that I just think is is different. I wonder if Tim Hyde's watching. Tim, I, I'm just of course curious. he is. You think he is? Of course he is. Yeah. I think uh, the I other think thing is too, like you know, of all the athletes that we recruit and all the speed that Freeman's bringing on campus, you know, you've got a Salerno back there, and it's just like. That's the best we can roll out there, you know. I mean, it's just that there that's always been a little frustrating for me right. ever since I started doing this. As you said that, I'm thinking of the the human element side of things. Like Matt Salerno is this guy who's a, a foxhole guy, has been with your program for so many years. He, he earned his way to a scholarship. We want to get this guy on the field because we just love him, right? I, the, I'm just trying to put myself in the coaching staff shoes, maybe just in that, in that um, you know, in, in the goog. Man, just put him up on return, fair catch it, get him back there. Just get our boy some playing time, get him something. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm spitballing. What's well, the yin and that's the beauty of football, man. I say it every weekend when I'm training my kids. It's the yin and the yang of football. So it's like if the scouting report on Notre Dame's punt return team was like, oh shoot, we got to spend an extra twenty minutes every day getting ready for this block scheme, and then we come out with a hold up uh, return to set up an actual return, you're going to catch people off guard. Yeah. I mean, you're naturally, you're going to get a better return from that because they're so accustomed and um, scared of getting one blocked. Yeah. Bernie says a great show. Always met her with the third amigo. I know. I know. I, I missed him. We, 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 we do our, 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 uh, our three man shows. You know, we'll, we'll definitely keep doing it. All right. A couple super chats, Tyler, and we're going to get to this running back and, and quarterback topics. I promise. Tyler says, when we miss a game-winning field goal, they might rethink. I, I totally disagree because they're bringing in the most experienced guys. It's not like, uh, you know, oh, what's – if Notre Dame keeps bringing in these grad transfer quarterbacks, what's it going to mean for record, recruiting at the high school level? Like, this is not that conversation. This is kickers. You know, like, you, I think you could bring in the best grad transfer kicker every single year. It's not – if they're not recruiting high school guys, then who cares? Like, I – so I would push back on that. You'd feel a lot better with a fifth-year guy kicking a game-winning field goal versus a 18- or 19-year-old, right? Absolutely, Mike. There's far less unknowns in rec- – I mean, specifically, let's recruit a kicker from a cold-weather climate that's got four years of experience, et cetera, et cetera, under his belt and rolling the dice against a kid that can kick at 65 yards and – high school and looks cool on YouTube, but it's also the Mike Goolsby show. And let's not spend any more time talking about kickers, brother. Speaking of looking cool on, uh, on YouTube, you might <clears throat> uh, do appreciate the super chat, Tyler for B Huggins says, I'll say this. It takes a combination of competitive spirit and desire slash need looking at some of the recruit Christmas living rooms slash Christmas trees need. I have no idea. I know what he means. Are. Okay. I have no idea. So he's saying, uh, He's basically touching on like, and when you look at some of the recruits, you'll see Coach Marcus Freeman and, and name an assistant coach posing with the family. There's lofted ceilings. It's like you know, 15 foot clear height. They've got some massive Christmas sure. tree. He's alluding to the fact that these are like well-to-do families, and uh, because of that, maybe the kids don't have the same com- competitive spirit, fire, need, love for football, etc. And I, I, I mean, I think there's some validity to that. And I think that I've, I've touched on that before on this show. Yeah. You need more kids that need football that I'm telling you, there's, there's something very real. It's something I could have asked Fasano about and probably should have, but uh, absolutely. Okay. 
I, I yeah, I, think I, just, those I don't like just, hearing it. It just that just bothers me. But I also understand that you know there might be. Well, you know, Freeman's touched on this. Like um, Tyson Ford was like a kid that Brian Kelly might not have went after, you know, just because of the everything. And it's like, okay, you know, Marcus Freeman brought. Well, I love this kid. So yes, depending on backgrounds and academics, there's a natural correlation between Notre Dame and that, but. You know, it's turning over more stones. And this is what we talked about with academics. It's like just because a kid has a 2.9 as a sophomore in high school, don't rule them out. Dangle the carrot. Dangle the carrot. So, yeah, I, I tend to – I mean, I get what the what the poster is saying. I do. Right, I'm glad you would decipher that because I had no idea. But for B. Huggins, I really do appreciate the Super Chat. Okay. Let's uh, let's, let's get back into our uh, position. Our still little State of the Union offense – someone that you were very, very excited about. Um, I think like the very first player that I, I talked to you about when you, when you joined our, you know, our blue and gold staff, um, you know, as our football analyst, Chris Tyree, what to do with him now? It's his senior year. I can't believe um, how quickly it, it, it's right. His career has just flown by. It was the first recruiting class I covered since I joined blue and gold back in May, 2019. And, and it seems like Mike, he is dude. All right, you got Diggs and Estime at the top, you would assume, right? I think the world of Jadarian Price. Jabran Payne has had really good reviews in spring practice. But what do you do with uh, w- with Chris Tyree at this point? I kind of think <clears throat> you do exactly what you're doing. I like this plan. I, he's still a running back. Um, that gives you some more flexibility from that mis- mismatch perspective in the passing game, I do. It's unfortunate, and I've talked about this on the message board once or twice, but, like, a guy like Chris Tyree, you know, if you ran outside zone with a cutback or something like that, I mean, you know, you seeing the game through the line, the eyes of an inside linebacker, like, I'm worried about his speed. I'm going to fly to the edge, and then, boom, he puts his foot in the ground, creates a cutback with his kind of dimin- diminutive stature, Again, he's a tough tackle to make in a hole. But the way that he's been coached at the college level, like he never stays square to the line of scrimmage. His shoulders are always tilted almost towards the sideline, which to me takes away that cutback vision. You feel me on that? Okay. So it's like, and there's the, where's the mesh point? Is the quarterback, you know, we're doing it out of shotgun versus being under center. It's just different looks. I still think he could be a really good running back, but I like what they're doing with him. And, yeah, it's a full – a full stable on paper. It's a full stable this spring. All they've got is Audrey Gestime. Yeah. So, and in yeah. pain and pain. Yeah. Diggs. What to do right. with Chris Tyree? Use him as a punt returner. And I think they've, they've done so in the past, but are we going to talk about the running back group as a whole? Let's talk about it. Okay. You know, I'm a bigger Estime fan than I am Diggs. I just, uh, Look at that face. I mean, come on. Look at that face. Listen to the press conferences. Oh, he's amazing. He's amazing. What what makes you say that? Just listening to him. He's just he's he's a little bit reserved, but then you hear him singing the fight song, you know, a couple years ago. He's just Energy. a goofy kid. I think he's just Energy. something to be around. I liked interviewing him. Pretty no nonsense kid, you know, not a big media guy, which I always love. You know, selfishly, I wish it's, it's better for business when the kids do want to talk. But like, I appreciate it's just about his business and doesn't really care about Twitter. You know, like I just, you know, just good kid, man. You got a lot of energy though, right? Yeah, he does. I mean, he's in a way, one of those guys who's you know, when when you, when you're buddies with them, the more you get to know him, more he opens up. I think he's that kind of kid. I I just see a lot of Kyron Williams in him in terms of like his his DNA, not not the physicality, yeah. not his you know body. But just the way that he's wired, he's a competent kid. He almost seems like he's bubbling over with energy at times. And, like, this is, like, twice now that he's kind of reinvented himself as a football player. I mean, I met him at the spring game thing, and he is deep. Like, in terms of, like, front to back, he is deep. Uh, And now he's trimmed himself down. He's constantly working to get better. Like, Logan Diggs, bro, you've missed all spring because you pulled your hamstring. And I, I tend to believe, like, and Logan Diggs hasn't really done much with his body. I know he had a shoulder injury. I had the same injury, torn labrum, but you come back from that. 
his body hasn't really changed much. And I tend to look at, and I could be wrong, but it's just my perspective that somebody's body in terms of how clean it is or lean it is or big it is, et cetera, is a reflection of like their commitment to the game, to the program, et cetera. And I just haven't seen it from Diggs. Now he's hurt. Um, and like, you know, like you said, you've got Jeremiah Love coming in. You got Price nipping at his heels. I mean, there's not room for, I mean, or is there? It's an amazing looking running back room, to be honest with you, man. On paper. Yeah. I mean, all six of these guys, I feel like can play. I just feel like, I feel like that Audric Estime, and I'm almost trying to just speak this into existence, put it out into the universe, but I feel like Estime is primed to be a star. I just do. I think that's like me saying Tobias Merriweather is primed to be, I don't think you're, it's not much of a, a leap, you know? Like, I think that's, that's kind of the But concept. I mean a star, like a, a star, like a top five back in college. I, like I do. It. I like it. I mean, just because he's shown the commitment. And yeah, I was watching Jerome Bettis film the other night. Like, you know, Jerome Bettis is a little bit longer of a strider. Like, ironically, he's a little bit looser of an athlete than Audric is. But um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Diggs. I just don't like the fact that he's injured all spring. And I don't like the fact that it's a hamstring. How do you pull a hamstring and be a running back? It's just like, don't make sense to me. But I mean, unless I'm forgetting someone, I'm an idiot. This is the same back. And that's two injuries with Diggs, by the way, too, right? right? It's, it's it's nobody's fault unless, unless you're yeah. Tyler Buckner, but it's two injuries. But, so the same running back room from last year. You get the, all these guys a year older, bring in Love. Um, Love's a special player. Price is a special player. I think Estime is a special player. Love it. Uh, Super Chat. Steven says, uh, Super Chat's for Singer to fly out and hang with Goolsby. Maybe – uh. You know, maybe we get to do that uh, across. Steve, the I'm, I couldn't agree more, man. We're trying to go to Ireland. I'm trying to make that happen. Yeah, I no, I, I I agree. One of these days, I'll meet you. I just need to make sure I know pretty far in advance so I can try to get my swole on, um, so I don't feel you know inferior looking. I mean, look at Goolsby just rocking the the biceps, He's making sure. He, yeah, now That's he puts the black his shirt, on. dude. The black <laughs> shirt's thinning, right? Don't they say that? All right, I think we're good on on running backs. So we're going to wrap it up Let's. with oh. the Hartman versus Buckner debate, dot, dot, dot. Again, I mean, we, we, we're just now uh, our 17 minutes into our shows. It might be breaking a re- – no, it might be breaking a record for a midweek show. I know for our Ohio State game last year we had a really long show, but um, <laughs> we're here at the end. But we've already talked about this like six or seven times uh, during the show. I mean – if, let's say, Mike, this is someone's first time tuning into the Mike Goolsby show. They have okay. no idea where you stand on who Notre Dame's quarterback should be for this year. Tell them what you think. I believe firmly that it should be Tyler Buckner. I think that there, there's a more physical potential. Um, and I think... The uh, I think he brings more to an offense overall in terms of with his legs. I think his arm talent is on par with Buck uh, with with Hartman, if not better than than Hartman. Hartman's got a weird release. Buckner has a strange or kind of odd release, but uh, Tyler's release is much quicker. And Sam brings that ball way back. He almost throws it like a like he looks like a white Byron Leftwich when he's letting that ball go. I mean, he throws it from his hip, and then. It was just, it's been frustrating. Again, this is for a new audience or a new viewer that, you know, Sam is just lauded over. Like, look at what he's accomplished. And it's like, guys, gals, he played for five years, you know? And it also bothers me that nobody else or not not enough people saw the potential in Tyler and what he did in the bowl game against South Carolina after fighting back from an injury, a major injury too, you know, a grade four or five, uh, AC sprain. It's no joke. He comes back and plays his ass off. There's a couple boneheaded plays, a couple silly picks, but um, this is third start ever. So uh, I just think that there's more upside. And then to my overall kind of trend here, Mike, and that we're sort of working, peaking towards 2024, Freeman's third year as a head coach. 
I want Tyler Buckner to have more experience. And that's the other thing, too. You almost have to put it in the comments that when I lost my mind that night, you almost have to link that podcast episode in this episode in the description if you could. But like, which one? One of my arguments was like, outside of Tyler's injury history, the inaccuracy and some of the decision making, the processing speed, I believe fully that that can be cured with game experience. Because, you know, Sam Hartman didn't roll out as a, as a true freshman, et cetera. You know, is Sam Hartman ever been an All-American, by the way? I know the answer. The answer is no. You know who was an All-American? Brandon Joseph, another transfer, right? Remember how excited everybody was for Brandon Joseph? Remember? He was an All-American. Not Tim Hyde. We forget. Okay, well, hey, how does Tim Hyde feel about uh, Hartman versus Buckner? You we, know? How does Tim Hyde feel right now or in two weeks? You know, it depends. So I just like, you know, again, I, I, I see the appeal for the Hartman thing, but I just think big picture for the state of a program, you're trying to build a program here, folks. Um, you know, you stick with a younger player that's been in the program that you recruited, et cetera. And um, I've always said, I thought Tyler was special. And I think, I mean, hell, Sam Hartman's going to get credit for Tyler Buckner's improvement. That's how flawed this whole thing is. You know, because Tyler's competing his ass off this spring. I have been told that the quarterback room is very tight. Sure. Hartman, I mean, coming in, this big shot, right? He's just one of the guys, you know. I, You know, he could come in and be like, all right, I'm just here for – I'm just here for my few months, win some games, get some NIL, and, and go to the – but no, he's really – I think like the Mike, you can speak to the struggles of Notre Dame, right? When you get to Notre Dame, like man, this place maybe not is what I thought it might be, right? Oh, it's a lot colder here than I thought it was. All that kind of stuff. I think he's kind of rallied around with rallied, you know, with with his young young teammates. Um, so I do think there is something to, and I, I think I've said this on either our show or you know my show with Tim. Like I've had you know Notre Dame sources tell me that. Hartman being in that room for this season is going to be the best thing that could happen to Buckner and Angeli. And I'm sure even to an extent, um, you know, um, uh, Minchie, you know, so I, I do want to say, I, I think that's a real thing, but, you know, just kind of learn from, from a guy like Sam Hartman. And again, this isn't Mike Singer's opinion. This is, you know, people who are, are okay, go ahead. What's just, you know, some of these things are, they're, they're nothing burgers, right? We're going to learn from Sam Hartman. What's he going to learn? Because they're both learning an offense. They're both, I mean, as far as like in Parker's offense, they're start both starting at square one, give or take. You, you know what I mean? So like, what's he really learning? How to handle himself like a pro is like Fasano was alluding to. Preparation, how to watch film, some of those things, how to carry yourself. Well, that's one thing that Sam's got going in his favor because he's a grad transfer, so he's not going to class. I mean, he has nothing to do all day but watch film, whereas Tyler's still going to class, you know. So, um, if anything to me, I've never met Tyler, but if anything to me, I think them bringing in a Sam Hartman just lit a fire under his ass, truly. I think if that's how – if he helped him at all. That's how I think – yeah, sure. If he helped them at all, it's just yeah, yeah, to bring out that competitive fire and really stoke it. But we'll see, we'll see. Uh, nothing, nothing matters. And Tim, Tim says this famously: nothing matters until Ohio State. Period. Nothing. You know, I think I'm, I'm, I think you've convinced me. I think I'm coming to the Buckner side. And then the other thing, um, I, I thought about this too. I was I'm joking, this. by the way. I'm joking. That's no, fine. Me. Well, no, I mean, your job is to kind of be impartial. But I, but I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, like, if you watch the games, Buckner, excuse me, Hartman isn't great at throwing an out route, a lot of bubble screams and a lot, a lot of deep balls. It's like, you know, and his, and again, I'm, I want Tim to talk about his record versus ranked teams, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and you got to talk about also the quality of play, the quality of defense, Mike, in the ACC. We, you remember when Notre Dame played North Carolina? I mean, their defense is trash. It's like, 
I've watched a lot of college football. It's literally it was bad. And he lost to UNC twice. Sam Hartman did. You know, I mean, the, the ACC sucks, dude. It's not good football. And he's never won anything in the ACC. Okay. Also, I was playing with Wake Forest. You know, but I don't know how much Wake Forest is. How many times has Wake Forest won the ACC? Like 2009? Beat Georgia Tech? But you're talking about they also play who else? I mean, name the other teams in the ACC. Duke, Virginia. I mean, name me a powerhouse program in the ACC lately. Clemson? Okay. Florida State? Mm, lately. Very lately. No, they, the ACC is terrible. Very lately. My point. Yeah. But since so Buckner, he's playing, I'm sorry, playing. since Hartman started there, you know, in 2004 um, or 2005, you know, <laughs> but yeah, to my point, I mean, he's playing poor defenses week in and week out. Yes, he put up some numbers. Yeah. I mean, I see it, but I'm just saying, I, I almost just beg people to look through it with a little bit finer tooth comb. You no, know, look through it with the Tyler Buckner love lens like Mike Goolsby does. That's what you need to look through it with. Hey, man. I, we don't yeah. see that. No, I just, I, I'm rooting, rooting for Tyler. I hope he stays healthy. Full House Backfield drops 1849, says so appreciative. Of Goolsby as an alum, he and Fasano talked about making hay in the winter slash spring, but there's so much more time in the summer summer slash fall. Why are gains made in one versus the other? Appreciate the super chat. Um, it's just probably off the top of my head. Appreciate the super chat. Just the nature of things. Like, I think the I think leadership is established. That's through my lens. I think the leadership's established during winter workouts. Because the winter workouts are the worst, especially in South Bank. I mean, you're walking over there at you know 5:30 in the morning. I can remember before they re reconfigured campus, Mike, but there was a street that went through on the way to the indoor facility. And I almost like some of those mornings I'd like beg that a car would hit me so I could like get out of that workout that morning. True story. <laughs> like at least run my foot over or something. But yeah, I think that the team leadership is established during winter and summer workouts. But in terms of the football full house backfield, to answer the question, spring is just compete, fundamentals, kind of break it down, compete. And then when you get into fall camp. Install. It's install. I mean, it's like, you know, and that's what kind of sucks for us. I mean, we're going to spend a lot of time, at least defensively speaking, we're going to spend waste a lot of time prepping for a Navy week one, you know, where it's like, you'd almost wish you're you know, preparing for an Ohio State, like almost sprinkle that into your, your prep. But that hopefully that answers the question. It's just the nature of it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, I think it's too late like... during the summer to figure out who your starter is. It just is. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I think that uh, that just about wraps it up, Mr. Gorby. Any, any closing thoughts before we get you out of here? No, man. It's good to be back. Yeah. Um, Looking forward to the spring game. And I think that uh, I had one other thought that I wanted to make. And I, I ran this by Tim in terms of the guards, right? Because the guards is a big, who's going to be our two starting guards? Whatever combo you want, you got two, three kind of cupcakes in terms of our schedule before the big game against Ohio State. I think it'd be fun if you were a coaching staff, just throwing it out there where it's like, I'm going to start player A and player B in the first half week one, and then I'm going to start player C and D in the second half of week one. And then I'm going to start pl start player C and D first half week two, and then play A and B in the second half. So I'd like to maybe give a couple different players, if this competition is that close, split some game reps by half for the first two, three weeks of the season, go back, break down that film, and then coming out of those two, three weeks, we have our starters for Ohio State. Slim chance, though. Yeah. Slim fun. chance. Offensive Why, line coaches they go with, do that. Go, maybe Rudolph's different, but I feel like O line coaches go with their guys and they're going to stick it out and they're going to gel and they're going to mesh as a unit. And I don't think O line coaches like to lose that that chemistry and, and, and time with those guys working together. Fair point. Fair point. I mean, I, I just think. I mean, look at those. Tennessee I like the stadium. idea. I just don't see it. I don't think they're going to do it. Yeah. It's just interesting because, like, you're you're basing all of that. You're judging that 
such an important position um, just off of going against yourselves, you know, the, the same, you're going against Jason Anya, Howard Cross every single day. So it's like, if you could mix in different body types from other teams, I just, it'd be interesting, man. Yeah. I just wondered, like, does the staff, they know what they, they have. You would like to think that with well, Rudolph might line, not though. I mean, Rudolph just got here. Yeah. Yeah. Parker. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. That was the only thing that I only note that I didn't really get to. I will be at the spring game. Of course, Goolsby and I were both in South Bend for it last year. I didn't get to actually go to the spring game. I, I had to, you know, do our post game show and um, had recruits that I was seeing, uh, you know, when they were in town and everything. But uh, so I'm, I'm actually going to be there. But Mike was not able to make it in this year. No, not this year. But uh, well, I'm sure we'll still do a live show uh, afterwards uh, with myself and Hyde, and we'll have Goolsby on uh, probably a day or two afterwards. But all right, well, that's cool. going to wrap up. 90 minutes. People say Mike Singer doesn't like a long show. No, 90 minutes, man. Oh, I like a 90 minutes, man. Nice and clean. Yeah. All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up. Appreciate your folks for watching until the end here. Make sure you hit that thumbs up if you haven't yet. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Leave a kind review on podcast, um, you know, wherever you get your podcasts. And head over to blueandgold.com for so much more coverage of Notre Dame football and recruiting. Appreciate you all. And as always, we'll catch you next time.